BBC Music introducing Live Introducing Live is for anybody wanting to work out their next step in the music industry. I'm James Threlfall, presenter of BBC Introducing in the West, and the next half an hour is a masterclass with none other than Pendulum. Now, I've been a huge fan of drum and bass since the age of 13, and I literally discovered the genre because everyone at my school back in the summer of 2005 was going wild about a certain group called Pendulum's debut album, Hold Your Colour. I fired it on, immediately fell in love, and without realizing, my world opened up to a whole new style of music I'd never heard before, and I'm still listening to 15 years later. So for a conversation about the rise of D&B, it felt only right to involve Pendulum's co-founder and vocalist, Rob Swire. We're gonna be chatting through the group's rise from underground to headline, the process they go through when creating music, advice for aspiring producers, and much, much more. So sit back and enjoy. So Rob, huge thank you for joining us for BBC Introducing Live 2020. I guess we should just kick off right back at the start. It seems like the natural place. Where did things begin for Pendulum? Uh, we met in we met in Perth around sort of 2000, 2002. Um, I'd been sort of making breakbeats and hardcore and uh, trance back in Perth. And I'd never really been a fan of like early sort of jungle. It really wasn't my thing. The sort of edited breakbeaty sort of ap- don't want to throw out names, but it's hard to say without like Aphrodite sort of style, like very very breakbeaty, steppy and stuff. Um, everyone we knew was kind of into it. I was I was a bit like I was a bit cold on the whole thing. And then um, Gareth kept trying to get me into it. Like he was bringing me all sorts of stuff. Ed Rush and Optical. I was like, yeah, well, that's a bit better. It's a bit darker. You know, he then he showed me sort of bad company and conflict, and, and that's that was sort of the first stuff I really liked out of drum and bass. And we, from then on, we just you know decided to start to start making stuff. And you came from that kind of rock and metal background, right? What was it that kind of made you want to move into like drum and bass and electronic sounds? I'd, I mean, I'd been I'd been producing before that, so it was uh, it was kind of just natural to combine them. Um, plus, we we had a band at the time, and. The the roadmap for actually doing something with drum and bass uh, seemed a lot uh, seemed a lot more immediate than than with the band. The band was like, right, do we go to a label? Do we try and get signed? Do we try and get noticed amongst you know a million other bands that sound exactly the same, or do we just you know start doing this other music that we're listening to? And we we chose that one. And you and Gareth and Paul, you moved to the UK in two thousand and three. Was that to be immersed in the UK scene? What was the what was the move there? Um, it, it was. I'm not sure whether it's the case anymore. Uh, back then, it was definitely the case that if you if you really wanted to make a splash in drum and bass at all, you had to be in the UK. It was just the home of all that stuff. It was where all the big nights were. Um, it was where all the DJs were that wanted to play our stuff, and we sort of had we had uh, DJ Fresh saying to us, you know. Come over to London. I'll give you guys a place to stay for free, and you know you won't have to pay any rent. And you can. And we were like, well, damn, we're not, we're not going to be able to afford to live in London otherwise. And that's a pretty good sort of launch point. So we uh, we we hopped we hopped over. Did you have an idea that things were going to take off at that point though? Because I, I mean, I say two thousand and three, things moved super quickly for you from there, right? Yeah, I mean, it didn't feel like it at the time, probably because we were younger. But um, it it was pretty quick. It was sort of you know we were. It, it was it was quite an experience as well. I mean, we sort of landed here and all the houses were smaller and there's more people in the street than in Perth. Um, we were sort of moving from rental place to rental place. At some point we found like a Turkish man's house with like a purple bedroom and all sorts of weird squares in the corner. We just set up a studio in there and, and, and uh, nailed Hold Your Colour. Was Vault the first official tune you worked on? Because I've seen online a few kind of disputes as to whether it was Vault or Spiral. Yeah, it was definitely Vault. Um, Spiral, I think, 
came. Um, I'm, I'm not sure which one was released first, but Vault definitely came before before Spinal. And Vault was like super instantly well received by the DMB scene. Did you realize? I mean, you talk about like DJ Fresh and knowing those guys then, but did you quickly realize you were onto something? It was it was going pretty well. Not really. To be to be honest, it wasn't. You know, I wasn't that great a fan of the track, um, but it's still probably one of the one of the craziest. Uh, reactions to any tune that we've done but especially because at the time we were nobodies um, but we saw we saw people playing it out in Perth and you'd see like girls getting drinks at the bar and sort of dudes just doing nothing and then Volt would play and they'd all stop and sort of uh, get on the dance floor um, and then we sort of saw footage over here of like Andy C starting with it in his sets we saw Ed Rush uh, open with it at the end and we were, we were like damn that's uh, didn't expect that and then stuff just went from there pretty quick. It's it's amazing in retrospect how uh, I don't know, th things could have turned out very differently. It was only by like a stroke of luck. Uh, I think it was um, Paul uh, El Hornet gave the track to one of the guys from Concord Dawn, uh, a New Zealand group back then. And uh, they sort of gave it to Doc Scott. Doc Scott decided to sign it. And it's like, man, if, if, if one of those things just went wrong, I could have been, I don't know, sitting in Perth at an IT job or something. So talk me through Hold Your Colour. What was the journey of that one like? When did you start moving into like, okay, we're gonna gonna work on a bigger release? I, I guess since 2004, the plan was always to have an album and Breakbeat Chaos, our label at the time, they were pushing us for an album. And it was it was a hard one because you know we'd recently moved to the UK. We were hearing all this sort of stuff at you know we were, we were going to play like slam and vinyl and all these sort of different super drum and bassy events with sort of five MCs on stage and. The stuff which was which was going off at the time was sort of like the riffy kind of jump up stuff, like uh, hazard clips and all that kind of stuff. And we were sort of like, "Damn, what should we do? Should we do a bit of that?" And uh, I think I think we tried to make a few tunes like that, and, and eventually we decided, like, "Look, this is uh, we're sort of getting bored with this style. We just got to put some instruments in, or, or, or we're not happy with it." And did it quickly blow up for you? Like, did you kind of? expect to get the reaction that it did because it it went wild pretty much straight off the bat right when it released yeah but i, I mean we, we didn't really expect anything there seems to be a theme that like if the more pessimistic we are about the release the better it seems to do um which is weird it's uh so i was telling gareth at the time like you know like people were still buying music on vinyl and stuff back then and we were like man if this doesn't sell more than sort of twenty thousand, then we just let's just go back to perth and just <laughs> call it a day but it ended up, of course, it sold like 300,000 and went platinum straight off the bat. Where did you go from there? Like mentally, you're like, this has surely exceeded, you know, our biggest dreams for, for this release. Where do you look then? What do you look to do? It's, it's weird. Stuff tends to get more confusing the bigger it gets. Like at, at first when, when like you get Andy C playing Vault and all that stuff, it's like, wow, damn, that's, I didn't expect that. That's crazy. And then when stuff gets even bigger than that, it just becomes a blur and you're like, right, well... I have no idea what to do now. And I guess that was, I don't know, we, we were sort of actively trying to avoid the whole second album syndrome thing. And I think we, we dove headfirst into that more than we expected. Did you kind of get a sense though that you'd maybe taken drum and bass somewhere it hadn't been that yet? Like you talked about how you didn't kind of want to emulate other styles, you just wanted to be yourselves. And I guess coined that signature pendulum sound pretty much straight away. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to have a perspective like that on your own, on your own music. Um, so to us, it's, I don't know, we, we had no idea whether we were sort of conforming to what drum and bass sounded like or the, whether we were doing something completely different and everyone was going to hate it. It's it's very hard to tell when it's your own stuff. Mm. I mean, my background comes, uh, like I'm a skateboarder, I come from a skateboarding background. And for me, my introduction to skating was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. And there's so many people around the world that like those video games got them into skating. And for me... Hold Your Colour was my introduction to drum and bass. Like, Hold Your Colour was my Tony Hawk's Pro Skater for drum and bass. Did it feel weird that you were doing that for so many people? Because I remember guys at my school, it was the same. Like, you know, there were so many people finding a genre based on Hold Your Colour. Not not really. It was, we it was weird to us because we were kind of, uh, I don't know. We, we were on, we were on, 
uh, rough terms with the drum and bass scene by then, kind of already. So the fact that people were listening to us and then getting introduced into drum and bass from that was weird to us. It was like, well, I mean, I guess it's 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 cool in retrospect since they they got to hear more more music. But yeah, you were the first group that I saw headline a festival at NAS back in two thousand and seven. That was like my first big gig that I saw. Did it feel? quite crazy to quickly rise to headline slots yeah i mean as I, as i said like the the bigger stuff gets the more it turns into a blur and the more it just becomes a thing that you have to do because the show is booked and you, you don't really get much of a chance to go like oh wow this is crazy and like five years ago i was sitting at home in my, in my pants it, it never really sinks in like that but i think I, I think the first time it actually sunk in was when we played the uh reading festival i think it was the bbc uh i think it actually was the bbc introducing stage um, at Reading in 2008, and that was sort of the first time I was like, "Damn, that's that reaction's a, a cut above what we expected." I guess Reading as well with your your rock and and kind of more metal roots that must feel pretty cool. Yeah, it did, and and there was sort of the reaction from it was like, "Oh man, we had to get security down to stop people coming into the tent, and there was almost people dying and stuff." And we were like, "Wow, that's 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 great." Well, not the people dying, obviously, but uh, the reaction. When did you ins- decide? Obviously, we talk about the kind of the heavier guitar sounds there. When did you decide you were going to incorporate more of those roots into your music? Because obviously, it felt like, like you say, there was a switch from Hold Your Color into in silico three years later um i think it's just what was happening in, in music at the time you know you like you back in 2008 if you remember there was like you had arctic monkeys that were smashing it you had klaxons you had uh who else uh you had sort of muse and they were all doing super well um on radio and to us we've never we've never really been too interested in like hey this is popular let's do that but coming from a band background we're like well damn we, we like this sort of stuff anyway so why don't we try and why don't we try and sort of merge them together and, and think of something new? Did you feel like combining the different sounds actually took your music to a wider audience of, of people though that maybe hadn't engaged with drum and bass yet, but were engaging with rock and metal and kind of expanded that fan base? I, I think it did. That that wasn't really the plan, but that is definitely what it ended up doing, which is which is nice. Um, we were kind of we thought we'd uh, we thought we'd completely sort of messed up on in silico to be to be quite honest. And uh, when that came out, we were like, "God oh, damn, this is gonna this is gonna sound like a mental breakdown." But um, the, the reaction to it was 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 insane. It was it was really good, and and it, and it brought us fans that we you know hadn't hadn't had before who previously might not have listened to electronic music. That was cool. How come you felt like it had, uh, like you'd messed up on in silico? Was it just like a completely different sound, or what? Yeah, we. I mean, we had an idea of what it should be, and I think our plans were just too <laughs> grandiose. So it, there was an element of like, oh man, this isn't turning out the way I wanted it to. But there was also like, I don't know, there, there was a sense of like, oh man, the drum and bass, <laughs> drum and bass community isn't going to like this one, and and they didn't. Um, but you know, the the the. There was all sorts of people getting into it who who probably previously didn't listen to drum and bass. So, I mean, in silico and then immersion obviously followed in close succession, and all three albums that you've released have, have gone platinum. But perhaps more crazy, you were the most played artist at BBC Radio One during the release of Immersion in 2010, and then headlined Radio One's big weekend that year. How did it feel to achieve that in literally eight years? I mean, you talk about kind of just rolling with it and it just naturally rising. But yeah, how did how did it feel to kind of get to that point where, okay, Radio 1, like we are the most played artist right now? Well, see, I didn't know that statistic back then. But had I known it, it would have been crazy. But And it's crazy now. Um, yeah, that is, that is mad and daunting. Did you always have in mind that after immersion in 2010, you were maybe going to give Pendulum a rest? Not really. Um, we felt this sort of, I don't know, we just saw this wave, this undercurrent of electronic music coming from coming from the US. And to us, it wasn't a million miles away from what Pendulum was doing, but it was different enough that we were like, oh man, we can't, 
we, we can't get on board with this sort of style without ruining what Pendulum's been doing. But we still want to be involved, and we love the production. We we sort of want to have a want to have a go at it. So um, I don't know. At, at that point, we we tend to get very bored of whatever we're currently doing, and we'd been doing Pendulum for what felt like a long time then. Um, so I think it was just time to to try something else. And obviously, that was when Knife Party was born, right? Yeah. And how did that feel going? W- w- like you say, you'd obviously kind of come to that natural point, but did it feel like quite a, a gutsy move to go? Yeah, actually, we're going to put Pendulum to bed for now, and then kind of, I guess, form something under a completely new name. Not really. I, th- I think, it, in retrospect, it was a gutsy move, and, and people were telling us like, "You're crazy." Like, um, I think even our manage- manager at the time was, was like, "You know, you know, qu- quitting Pendulum to do this is like, you know, quitting the Olympics to be a janitor or some- something like that." And we were like, "Well, I don't know." I- I- in a way, I think that's when we work best is when is when no one cares and you've got to sort of prove yourself. I, I love that sort of, I, I love that scenario. And again, it kind of went from zero to 100 really, really quickly. It seems to be the trend, I guess, with the music that you release. But what were you seeing? You talk about the different genres maybe coming more out of America at that point. What were you seeing that you could do with Knife Party that you didn't feel quite felt with, with Pendulum in particular? I mean, it was it was mainly just the mix of the mix of genres. Like you you were you were seeing like uh, Skrillex and Dylan Francis at the time, and sort of Alvin Risk and all these sort of people, and they were or Kill the Noise, and they were doing you know, they were doing drum and bass one minute, then they do dubstep for another minute, then house, and then all this stuff, and no one really cared what genre it was. There wasn't the sort of headsy, this is, has to be drum and bass, man, sort of one seventy four purist thing that we had that we had in the drum and bass scene. It was just like. Make whatever you want, and and uh, and people sort of dig it. So we were like, the, I guess the the freedom was appealing. We talk about how it blew up and and went much the way of Pendulum, and obviously you've now got the two going side by side. And we'll talk about coming back to Pendulum in a moment's time. But I did just wonder if we might be able to briefly dive into the writing process and kind of break down how you put together a track. It's weird. It's, it's never really the same the same way, and my memory tends to be quite bad. So. Uh, I've I've got sort of tips and techniques that I forget uh from one song to the to the next and then I have to sort of remember the process as I do it. But um generally I'll come up with a whole bunch of sort of demos and and send them to management, send them to send them to Gareth and out, out of sort of maybe six tracks there'll be two that they're like those ones are great and then we'll just continue working on those ones. Um but yeah, it tends to just be me sitting in a room <laughs> throwing anything at the wall and seeing seeing what sticks. Is it generally kind of chord progressions you start on? Is there a preferred instrument that you go for straight off the bat, or can it, like you say, literally be throwing anything and, and, and playing around with anything? It, it's literally just trying anything. I mean, it can be it can start off with a chord progression, and then it I find some weird sound, and then decide that the whole track should be based around that. Or you can have a heavy track that turns out to be quite a sort of mellow thing, and and it's uh, I, I don't I don't really like I don't really like sticking to the uh, original concept. I, I kind of like being free to just do whatever, you know, let let the track go wherever it wants. So out of interest, we talk about the the songs that you've written and, and the tracks you've worked on. Is there a favourite Pendulum song you've got, and if so, why? Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, I tend tend not to like songs once they're released, but. Um, I think probably Crush on Immersion is probably one of, one of my favorites still. I mean, between Pendulum and Knife Party, you've had obviously such a huge experience of different electronic sounds and being at the top of your game. Starting up in 2002, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in the world of electronic music as you've gone through? I guess the access- accessibility. Um, 
when, when we got into this stuff, it was like doing stuff on a laptop and being able to do everything on your computer was kind of a new thing. And we, we were coming into a scene where there was sort of like these uh, kingpins of the scene who were, have, were at the time sort of having trouble getting their head around doing everything in the box. They were sort of like, they were still working with sort of hardware samplers and sort of running their stuff through mixes and, and recording it to DAT and stuff. So, so our way of doing things at the time was like, was a bit new and weird. Whereas now you've got sort of kids doing YouTube tut tutorials, like everything you want to know about anything is, is online and someone can walk you through it. And it's a um, very different, different world. In terms of drum and bass, obviously, you guys massively kind of took that to places in it that, that it hadn't been before with the different kind of sounds and, and incorporating different genres in there. Does it kind of feel crazy that it has such a huge fan base and following nowadays in comparison to maybe when you started out? Kind of. It felt, it felt bigger then. Um, I'm not sure if that's just, the, if that's just uh, me seeing it, you know, with the nostalgic glasses. But like at the, at the time, it felt way bigger, I guess, because we were the, you know, it was, it was new to us back then. But um, when we were doing Knife Party, we didn't really hear much of what was going on in the scene. So, so when we came back and saw like, oh, there's this festival in, in the Czech Republic with like, and it's all drum and bass and it's on the sort of scale, it's got sort of Tomorrowland-ish production and stuff. We were just like, what the hell? I think it does kind of feel like, yeah, that side of electronic music has just massively grown to those almost like super festivals now that even like it felt like 10 years ago might have been hard to imagine but we talk about 10 years ago which was obviously the last time that you released music under pendulum how does it feel to be back and releasing new music good because we it's it's something different and we always get bored of what we were last doing so uh pendulum now feels new and and kind of exciting but um i don't know i think i think our relationship with the whole scene thing is is still it still feels weird i, I mean obviously it's not as uh People have sort of accepted it now that so Pendulum just do their thing and that's that. And if you're a super purist sort of heads drum and bass fan, then you, Pendulum's probably not even on your radar. But I think people have accepted that now and it's, it's, it's a lot more comfortable. What made you feel like this is the right time? After a decade, it feels like a good time to release music as Pendulum again. Um, the EDM thing seemed to be so, sort of dying somewhat, and we haven't sort of we haven't fallen out of love with it. We still love sort of house music and, and all that sort of stuff. But it did feel like I don't know. And I think even I think even Zane called me up at the time. He was still at the BBC, and he called me up, being like, "What are you going to do now? It's dead. What are you going to do?" And I was like, "Damn it!" <laughs> like secretly I knew it, but it's a hard thing to admit. Um, whereas I don't know, we sort of missed playing as a band. We sort of missed uh, playing instruments and stuff and, and playing live. So so that was a big part of it. To celebrate the release of your new tracks, Nothing For Free and Driver, you released a performance from Spitbank 4 in the middle of the English Channel. How did that idea come about to kind of celebrate in that way? Uh, that was our manager's idea. Um, initially, she was sort of thinking, um, she was thinking the Australian embassy and I'm like, eh, it's not really like... In Australia, they'd be like, oh, come on. They wouldn't have a bar of that. So I was, we were a bit... And then I think I think uh, I think she saw something about how there were some forts for sale in the middle of the ocean, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure how it came about. But uh, as soon as we heard that idea, we we're like, "Wow, that's 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 amazing!" And no, and no one's done it. Well, what do you have in the works then, Rob? In terms of new music, can you give us any details? Yeah, we got um, we're working on two more tracks uh, for imminent release. Uh, one of them is a collab with Hybrid Minds. And uh, the other one, uh, you'll have to wait and see. Amazing. Well, as far as being electronic music trailblazers, you've obviously, you've had a pretty long journey. What lessons have you learned that you can share that you feel are kind of like the key things if you could go back and tell yourself right now? One of them would definitely be that like, I don't know, where I've seen a lot of producers in their sort of 20s who think they're unstoppable, that they have the best production, they can go and do anything and all that stuff. And I think some of that sort of attitude's healthy. One thing I wish I could tell myself is that that does go away as you get older. Just uh, life has a way of sort of kicking your ego down a bit. And if you're not prepared to sort of, um, if you're not prepared for it, it can put you in a weird place musically. It definitely did for me. Um, and I think well, once you get over that, you're fine. But I think, I don't know, I think, it's a, I think it's a tough transition. In terms of we talk about the lessons that you've learned along the way, but just advice for aspiring artists, like electronic artists or beyond, what would you kind of give in terms of getting music out there, promoting yourself and carrying yourself as an artist? 
In terms of promoting and stuff, I have not a clue. I've I've seen some people that have some sort of up and coming producers that are so they're sort of more introverted, more introverted than even we are, and they're still like having to do the Snapchat, Instagram, all that stuff. Like, hey guys, this is blah blah blah, and I'm like, that is exhausting. And I think if I, I think if I think if I had to do that these days, I'd say, you know what, I think I'll take that IT job. So I don't know, that's that's kind of depressing and not inspiring, but there you go. <laughs> do you find you have people approach you with their music as well? Do, does that happen still? Uh, yeah, we get, a lot of, we get a lot of music. There's a lot of talented sort of people coming up. Do you appreciate that? Do you think that's a good way to get out there and hustle, kind of trying to just get your music in front of the right people? Or do you think there's other ways to go about it? Yeah, I think it's I think it's giving it to the right people. I mean, look at look at uh, look at Median. Like the way the way he kicked it off was uh, he was giving his tracks to a lot of people in the scene. He was sort of like best friends with uh, Porter Robinson, and Porter had sort of we've we'd done some stuff for him at the time. He'd done some stuff for us, and we were doing a remix competition. And I don't think we'd even included Madian's track in like the in the finalist. And then Porter said to us, you know, like, if you could find one that was sent from Medion, check that one out. And as soon as we heard it, we were like, damn, that kid is on another planet. And uh, and that was that was pretty much his sort of beginnings. So it's uh, it's giving it to the right people. Like, this stuff is always, you know, at least 30, 40% contacts and who you know and giving it to the right people. Well, talk me through briefly before we wrap things up. Obviously, you've got Pendulum Trinity going on at the moment. Obviously, can't be out there hitting up the festivals and, and big performances. But what is the situation behind Pendulum Trinity? Talk us through it. It's, yeah, it's the three of us sort of DJing. It's the, it's the well, the three of uh, us from Perth, at least, um, in a sort of DJ format, which uh, we haven't really done since we, we started in 2003. And um, it's, a, it's a great way to sort of test out new music and sort of, try different things on audiences that that might not be released yet and sort of see and see what works but yeah we'll definitely bring the band back at some point so is that the plan for 2021 then getting back out there more and, and performing more hopefully as soon as we can yeah definitely although who, who knows when that'll happen we'll keep fingers crossed that sooner rather than later we can make that happen it's been amazing to chat rob thank you so much and we really appreciate you taking the time and uh, with pendulum just starting to release new music again it feels only right to finish on a brand new track do you want to introduce it all right this is uh, pendulum nothing for free here it is we got the symptoms of a cold war all of our troubles and make believe we're dying on our own soul Friends onto the teeth. There's nothing for you, nothing for me, nothing for sale, nothing for free. You wanna take my life and fade
This masterclass is a series of 36. To hear the rest, head on over to BBC Sounds. BBC Music introducing. Live.